So I sat down to begin writing this video and it suddenly hit me that immediately after getting monetized, my first action is to make a kill the kill video. So Patreon and Kofi and Bandcamp are all linked in the description below. Kill the Kill is a 2013 anime by Studio Trigger, directed by Hiroyuki Amaishi and written by Kazuki Nakashima. It follows Ryuko Matoi, who, in a bid to learn the identity of her father's murderer, journeys to Hanoji Academy. Led by the indomitable student council president, Satsuki Kiryuin, and her elite four, who rule the school with an iron fist thanks to their powerful Goku uniforms. After a run-in with a living sailor uniform, Senkets, Ryuko was finally able to fight her opponents on equal terms. And so she embarks on a crusade against Hanoji, unaware that she is being pulled into something far bigger than she, or even Satsuki, realize. I first saw Kill the Kill when I was a wee weeb in high school, and Jesus Christ did it leave an impression. The wild, bonkers direction and script, the bombastic, iconic music, the insane off-kilter animation, this was the most anime anime that I had ever seen up to that point. And yes, that also includes its approach to fan service, which is probably why you're going to be seeing a lot more of me than the actual show. Indeed, one of the most infamous aspects of Kill the Kill is its utter indulgence in depicting the female form. And yeah, if you know anime, that doesn't surprise you. But Kill the Kill is kind of unique in how it handles its fan service. When it comes to the titillating aspects of anime, I find they often exist almost separate from the show itself. Like here we have the show and the characters and the plot and they're all doing their thing and they're moving along nicely and then BAM there it is! You've got the classic groping and falling, changing room scenes, beach episodes, the pervert characters. Sometimes the show doesn't even stop to comment on it, they'll just keep going like they didn't have the camera shoved up someone's ass for a whole minute. And now I look like the crazy one for pointing it out. I honestly have far more respect for shows like Gurren Lagann and High School DD which just own it and make it a part of the style. You want to flaunt how sexy your characters are? Fine, do it, but don't go acting like you're slick saying, oh, she's only dressed like this so she can use her powers. D d don't, don't talk to me like I'm stupid. Kill the Kill, on the other hand, is different. Like Guren and DD, the fan service isn't just something chucked in there on top of an already existing show. It's a fundamental part of the look and style. In fact, it's so prevalent and so over the top that at times it stops being titillating and almost crosses into parody. And yet, more than just being an aspect of the show's aesthetic or appeal, Kill the Kill's presentation actually does feed into its overall themes. The show, in the midst of all its chaos, asks questions of youth and of femininity. It tells a story of people rebelling against rigid societal structures and preconceived notions of how they should act, clothing being one of the tools used to enforce those roles. Is it any wonder that the rebels are called Nudist Beach, that Ryuko can only truly fight after getting over how exposed she is wearing senkets, that the more powerful the Elite Four are, the more skimpy their uniforms become, and, inversely, the closer Ragyo Kiryuin comes to her goal, the more conservative she dresses. You could probably make a whole video dedicated to examining that topic by itself, but I think I'll leave that for someone else to get into. The point being, Kill the Kill's fan service is an integral part of the show's style and identity. Rather than the entire show existing solely as an excuse to show tits, it feels like the show's direction and themes were conceived first, and then the fan service was added to support them. Or maybe they did just want to have naked women fighting each other and retroactively made it deep, but the point is it works. Of course, that doesn't mean it's automatically good. If the excessive skin still turns you off, then that's absolutely fine. But, in my opinion, it does at least make it more tolerable and the show at large more interesting than it would have been otherwise. 
It was one of the many aspects that stood out to me when I first watched it all those years ago. It is now March of 2022. I have just rewatched Kill the Kill properly for the first time since I first saw it, and it holds up pretty well. The bonkers presentation is still as entertaining as ever, the music is still great, the cast is one of my favourites in anime, and a lot of the analysis I just gave on Killer Kill's usage of fan service is stuff that I only really picked up on from that rewatch. So, in a sense, I appreciate it even more than I did back then. With one exception. One aspect of the show that left me feeling… unsure, to say the least. Content warning for sexual assault. If you're at all affected by these types of discussions, then consider this your cue to tap out. Thanks for watching this far anyway. When it comes to off moments in Kill the Kill, there are a few different parts of the show you can point to. Like Mikisugi being a bit of a creep, or the scene in the first episode where Senkets literally forces himself on Ryuko, or... But it's nothing too terrible by anime standards. It's confined to the first half of the series, and ultimately no one actually ends up being hurt. And yeah, I know how weird that sounds, and I wouldn't blame anyone for being turned off by the show, or most anime by this stuff, but you kinda just learn to deal with all this if you're a long-term anime fan. I don't forget about all of it, but I can kind of just sweep it under the rug and pretend it doesn't exist. The same, however, cannot be said for anything related to the show's main antagonist, Ragyo Kiryuin. So, Ragyo molests her daughters. A fair few times, actually, and I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. In a show where nudity is synonymous with power and liberty, it wouldn't be out of the question to explore the darker sides of topics like that. For the main characters to view nakedness as freeing, as something to draw strength from, only for the main villain to corrupt it, to take something that should be beautiful and liberating, and twist it into an ugly instrument of control? That can make for compelling conflict. But when it comes to depicting violence of this nature, presentation is important, and it is here where my thoughts become a little more… muddled. Right now I want to talk about the two scenes in which Ragyo abuses Satsuki specifically, in episodes 16 and 20 respectively. If you're still with me, then I'd recommend you watch the scenes yourself to refresh your memory, because I am certainly not going to be able to show most of them. Now I want to say it again, Ragyo doing what she does isn't bad in and of itself. Her character is centred around ideas of domination. She lives for the control she has over other people, be that through life fibres or other methods. Point being, it makes sense that a person like her would engage in abuse of this kind. My question is, what does the scene show other than that? Because if the only purpose is to introduce the kind of villain she is, essentially a kick the dog moment to show how twisted she is, then I don't know how comfortable I am with that. Because this kind of thing isn't just something you should have your main villain do with this amount of focus and detail without really examining it, and I fear that Kill the Kill doesn't really examine it as it should. The main point of contention for me is that Satsuki's thoughts, her feelings about what her mother does to her, aren't ever really explored, even after she breaks free from her clutches. You could write these two scenes out of existence, and they wouldn't really change anything else in the show. In essence, these scenes feel more about Ragyo, about establishing and reinforcing her character, than they do about Satsuki, the actual victim in the situation, and by not really exploring her side of things, by not really addressing what happens, despite the deliberate focus on these scenes, it almost trivialises the actual act itself. Also, I suppose we should address the elephant in the room. Is it also meant to be titillating? Not to name names, I really don't want to start beef or anything, but I've watched reactions to this show and this scene in particular, and it's clear that some people have a… unique interpretation of it. They found it hot, is what I'm trying to say. 
Now, whether or not this is because the show does a poor job of distinguishing between nudity we're meant to find entertaining and nudity we're meant to find uncomfortable, I don't know. There are certainly worse ways to direct a scene like this, Hello Sword Art Online, and I think the show does present it with a different atmosphere and tone than usual, but I highly doubt your generic Kuma is going to pick up on that, and unfortunately a show like this is going to attract people like that in their droves. The second scene is a little better in that there's no debate as to whether or not it's meant to be uncomfortable. It is. I don't want to meet the filth that thinks this shit is hot. But it also suffers from the same problem in that we don't really get much out of it, least of all in regards to Satsuki. We don't get any thoughts from her perspective about this. Now, you could probably infer how this almost certainly long-term abuse has affected her just by looking at the kind of person she grew up to be, and I would respect any attempt to try and explore this in a subtler, more nuanced way compared to the in-your-face presentation of the rest of the show. But because they never draw attention to it outside of these scenes, I have no idea if this subtext actually exists or if I'm just coping hard, trying to give this part of the show more justification than it deserves. However, there is one more thing I want to talk about, and that's the section where Ragio and Nue brainwash Ryuko, and unlike the ones with Satsuki, I actually like this one. Well, maybe like isn't the right word. Perhaps it would be better to say that I don't really have any problems with it, and that is mostly down to the fact that Ryuko's thoughts and reactions to what's happening are given far more weight than they are with Satsuki. Though to be fair, addressing it at all is a step in the right direction. Rather than just being yet another example of how fucked Ragio is, the focus on this part of the story is specifically on what's happening to Ryuko, and the whole episode is dedicated to the effect it has on her, as well as the attempts of her and her friends to break her free from the hold it has on her. Not only that, but the show uses it as a way to double down on themes of conformity, of feminine expectations and how they physically and mentally trap young women into becoming what society wants them to become. And thus, the initial brainwashing scene feels like it has more of a concrete narrative and thematic reason for existing than the ones with Satsuki, which I would only really describe as having potential thematic weight, depending on how you interpret the scenes. Sexual violence is a very sensitive topic to many people, and while that doesn't mean it shouldn't be written about or play a role in our fiction, you do need a certain kind of finesse if you want to incorporate it in a meaningful way. There are lots of stories that toss it in as a way to make their world seem dark and edgy, and I don't think Kill the Kill is one of those stories. There's just too much deliberate focus on this element for me to believe it was just tossed in there without a second thought, but maybe it could have done with… I don't know… a, a fourth thought? If it was just chucked in there then that would be one thing, but for it to come so close only to fall just short? It's frustrating. I think the show had the potential to make a very clear, very powerful statement about reclaiming one's body and taking pride in it, and perhaps you can still look at it in that light. All I'm saying is, the show could have done more, and because of that, despite how much I still like it, I can't help but feel a little disappointed. This video was made mostly for me, similar to the Eren Yeager video I put out last year. I kind of just wanted a way to sort out my confused feelings about a controversial aspect of a series that I have quite a bit of affection for, which is why the structure of this video might be a little looser than usual. If you're still watching, then thank you for putting up with me filtering through my muddled thoughts. This is also the first video I've made since hitting 1,000 subscribers, and I'd like to take a bit of a moment to address that. To everyone, thank you for taking an interest in my work. It really means a lot to me, and to all the new subscribers from my last two videos. Hi, I'm Kai. My pronouns are they, them, and I make video essays about... Well, it, it used to be anime, but now it's about whatever the hell I want. If you're subscribed because I talked about a specific game or show or anime and you're only interested in that, then hopefully I can introduce you to something new. I watch, listen, read and play a lot of stuff, and I can't wait to talk about it all. For your pleasure, of course. 
If you'd like to support me further, you can pledge to my Patreon, where I've set a couple goals. If we hit 50 patrons, I'll make a character analysis on Kai Shimada, my namesake. If we get to 666, I know, quite a jump, I'll make a series of retrospectives looking over each season of Attack on Titan. And if we hit 1,000 patrons, I'll make a massive Quentin Reviews-esque video reviewing and analysing the Bleach anime, all 366 episodes, including the upcoming Thousand Year Blood War arc. I'll probably think of some other, more realistic goals in the near future, and if you would like to help contribute to them, then the link is in the description below, as well as links to my Bandcamp, Ko-fi, and second channel. I'll probably think of some other, more reasonable goals in the near future, so if you'd like to help contribute to them, then the link is in the description below, as well as links to my Bandcamp, Ko-fi, and second channel. I shall see you all soon. Bye-bye.